Queer Afropolitans. Uh, my name is Daniel Hurwitz, um, and I am, for another month, I think, a board member here at CLAGS. Um, I'm so glad that you're all here tonight. Um, I'm especially appreciative of the work of the CLAG staff to organize tonight's event, Ben and Noam and Calais. Um, and one thing I just wanted to stress to you all is that CLAGS is a member-supported organization. CUNY gives us a room and turns on the lights, and then everything else that happens at CLAGS happens because of the support of donors and members. And so first of all, if any of you are members or donors to CLAGS, I want to thank you for your support. It allows events like tonight to happen. And then secondly, for those of you who aren't members, maybe there'll be something in tonight's discussion that will inspire and engage you. And if so, I hope you'll consider becoming a supporter of CLAGS. Um, tonight, we have the fortunate opportunity to think together about what it means to be queer in 21st century Africa and the African diaspora. The chance to really reflect on how queerness looks or is viewed in various African nations and communities, and to consider as well what it means to be sitting here in New York City at CLAGS and to be pondering such a question. We could not have asked for two better guides in this conversation than the two fellow, the two queer Afropolitans, I guess I should say, <laughs> seated here beside me. So let me just formally introduce them to you. Anthony Appia is one of our leading intellectuals and philosophers, someone who has devoted much of his life's work to thinking about the meaning and structure of systems of identity. He grew up between England and Ghana in a multinational family that he now says includes cousins, nephews, nieces, and in-laws on every continent, except Antarctica for the time being, presumably. <laughs> One of his earliest books, entitled In My Father's House, sought to untangle the mythology of Africa as a singular other place. And he is the editor with uh, Henry Louis Gates of Oxford University Press's Encyclopedia of Africa. He has also written multiple <coughs> volumes about identities, their power, and really the moral implications of systems of identity. Our title tonight of Afropolitans is in part a riff on the title of one of his recent books about cosmopolitanism, which I hope we'll talk about tonight, and which asks us to think about how systems of identity that universalize and say we're all the same can also accept and embrace differences. He has taught and lectured in multiple locations, but in 2014, this year, he started teaching philosophy and law at NYU, which is a boon for those of us who live in this city. We are also fortunate that New York City is being visited this month by Mark Gewisser, one of South Africa's most dynamic authors and journalists, a veteran sexuality rights activist and curator, and someone I've known for several years. In 1994, he co-edited and published his first book, Defiant Desire which set out to capture the stories of gay and lesbian living in South Africa. He's also written a prize-winning biography of Thabo Mbeki entitled Legacy of Liberation. Quite recently, Mark has been a fellow with the Open Society researching the global sexuality frontier, and I also hope he'll talk about that with us tonight. But the real inspiration for tonight's event is the publication of Mark's newest book, Mark, can you hand me my copy? <laughs> Just so I can hold it up. I guess you see the image of it on the screen. It's a memoir entitled Lost and Found in Johannesburg. It is a powerful book. It weaves together Mark's own life stories with the history of South Africa, the construction of apartheid in Johannesburg, and an investigation of the legacies that it continues to have in the very geography of that city. <coughs> Much like Mark's book, our hope for tonight is that we'll move a bit between the personal and the global in our conversation. 
We've decided that we'll try to cover a handful of topics initially for maybe 45 minutes or so. I'll try very gently to offer some prompting questions, but you will see quickly how superfluous I will become. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll open things up for your questions and thoughts about our topic. We thought that we could begin tonight with Mark reading a selection from his new book, a selection about getting married. And that hopefully that selection will set us up for our conversation about queer African living. So Mark. Thank you, Daniel, and thank you, Anthony, for, for doing this with me. It's, uh, uh, Daniel is an, an old friend and also a wonderfully creative historian of queer American history. So it's good to have you on the panel. And I know from our preliminary discussions that your, your contributions from your perspective as somebody who studied identity formation in the States will not be superfluous. We'll see. Thank you for hosting this. Um, uh, it's a particular honor to be uh, on this panel with Anthony. Um, Anthony's writing has been uh, a motivation for me. Uh, uh, his In My Father's House was really the book that got me thinking about how to use the personal register and to write um, subjectively in a way that opens up big ideas. And, and that's really what, what I tried to do in this book, Lost and Found in Johannesburg. Um, and then Anthony's book, Cosmopolitanism, which I have here, um, was one of, is one of the triggers for, for the work I'm doing at the moment, which is, as Anthony said, called The Global Sexuality Frontier, and which is, is looking at how we are currently in a, in a global conversation about the rights of sexual minorities and people with non-conforming gender identities, a conversation that was unimaginable 10 years ago. Uh, and a conversation that we don't really know where, how it's going to end, what's going what's to happen with this conversation. And, and, and if the purpose of my first, uh, the, the, the book that was inspired by In My Father's House was to, to un my, understand myself as South African and to understand, um, how, how South Af to understand myself as South African as a, somebody who's Jewish, who's white, who's gay, who grew up in apartheid South Africa in a society that is is defined almost um, obsessively, that defines itself almost obs obsessively with borders and boundaries, that where, the, where there's a, a, a particularly intense um, uh, self-consciousness about borders and boundaries. Um, the, the work I'm doing now on the global sexuality frontier is about how these identities are developing, these new identities, this, this, this new frontier for human rights discourse is developing in, in, in a world uh, that has much less boundaries, or where, where, where globalization, the digital revolution, mass migration, means that ideas travel in, in ways they never have before. Um, and, and what I'm really hoping in our, in our conversation today is, is that we'll, a, a, Anthony writes about, in, in cosmopolitanism, about, the, um, about universal values and, and, and their, very, their very local applications and what their, the relationship is between the two. And I think that's very much what the global LGBT rights um, debate at the moment is about. But, but hopefully in our conversation, we'll, we'll, I, I'm looking forward to, to flipping between my Johannesburg Afropolitan identity and my global queer identity. And I invite you to do the same. <laughs> um, I thought I, I would read from, from my book a chapter that sort of perhaps bridges uh, my two projects. Uh, this Johannesburg project and the next queer project. And I, I want to read from this too because it's about my marriage. And my partner, we don't feel comfortable saying husband, even though maybe we should, is in the room tonight. And even though we both sort of came of age and found our own sexual identity in New York and in the United States, it's our first time we've been in New York together. So this is a little bit of a celebration of that. Uh, some of you might know this piece because it's been published, it was published in the New York Times a few years ago. It's called Eden Vale. It took C and me more than 18 years to tie the knot. South Africa legalized same-sex marriage in 2006. We might have done it before then, as many of our friends did in private commitment ceremonies, but we had little interest in the rights and symbolism of marriage, even after it had become one of our new rights. We decided to do it three years later, 
solely because it would facilitate our move to France, where C had been offered a job. It was, we told each other, merely an administrative matter. We could have done it more easily through a gay rabbi I know, for example, or a gay judge who's a friend, but we wanted to see the system work for us, and so we decided to go to one of the home affairs offices. Even though we lived in Melville, on the other side of town, we chose Edenvale because friends had had a positive experience there. And so, on a January morning in 2009, I drove east across Johannesburg to a satellite town to make the booking. On arrival, I was not encouraged. The office was on a scrappy strip of motor repair shops and panel beaters, and like all home affairs offices, it was grimy and arcane, contemptuous and chaotic, the last place on earth you would want to get married. In the old days, the Department of Home Affairs had been the processing room of apartheid. It told you who you were and where you could and could not be. It was still a place of profound alienation, of a thousand frustrations and rages a day. And I was about to have one of them. <laughs> I'd been waiting in the queue since 2.30 and had only just made it to the front after 3 o'clock. Although the office closed at 3.30, processing stopped half an hour before, and I was too late, I was told. I would have to go home and come back tomorrow. I was on the brink of a spirited lecture on the meaning of Batopele, the government's new slogan of people first, when one of the women behind the desk looked at me, gold hoops in her ears to match her attitude, and barked, same sex or opposite sex? <laughs> it took me a moment to comprehend. Same sex, I said, a little too loudly, looking around to see if any of the other clerks in the room would look up in shock, or perhaps just interest. They did not. The marriage officer likes to do the same sex as early in the morning, the woman said briskly, consulting her book. Too much paperwork, you people. You've made our lives much too difficult. Before I could protest, the woman shoved a form across to me, noting the time and date of our appointment. Pulling out a green highlighter, she underlined a reminder that at least two witnesses were required. We have room for 20, she said, so bring all your friends and family. No, no, I protested, it'll be just two. We, we don't want to make a fuss. Why not? <laughs> when I shrugged and spluttered an answer, purely an administrative matter, she looked at me severely. A marriage is a big deal. Make a fuss. Don't forget the rings. Oh, we would not be doing rings. Why not, she repeated <laughs> again, before answering her own question. Ah, you don't want to make a fuss. And then in counseling mode, do you think you are a second-class citizen just because you are gay? You have full rights in this new South Africa. You have the right to make a fuss. I think you need to go home and have a very serious chat with your partner. We will see you on the 22nd of February with witnesses and dreams. Goodbye. Here I was, an entirely empowered, middle-class, middle-aged white man, being lectured to by a young black woman about my rights. And here we were, three weeks later, with rings, but alas, only two witnesses, our friends Philip and Sadiqa, being ushered upstairs by a delightful security guard who told Sadiqa she was a beautiful bride, but who shifted the compliment effortlessly to me when correct. <laughs> <laughs> we found ourselves in room eight, marriages, at the back of the building, overlooking a scrapyard next door. It was a parallel universe. The room was draped in lace, the same color palette as the as the orange and brown dried wildflowers set in vases between white porcelain swans. There were wedding photos of various couples tacked on the walls, and on every available surface, cascades of what turned out, on closer inspection, to be empty ring boxes. You like it, trilled a voice behind us. An older Afrikaans woman had entered. She introduced herself as Mrs. Austin. She was actually in finance, but she loved marrying people so much that she'd applied for a license and now did it two mornings a week. <laughs> this is all my work, she said of roommate, explaining that every couple she married was invited to leave its ring boxes behind, and that among these boxes were same-sex ones, too. She was proud of the fact that she'd married more gay couples than anyone else in the province. <laughs> Mrs. Austin made no secret of her disappointment at our lack of campery. Where were the feathers? Where the champagne? <laughs> After some jocularity over who would be the man by signing the register first, she led us through an unmemorably bureaucratic script ending in I do and a kiss, 
before presiding over what was clearly for her the more significant part of the proceedings, the swapping of the rings. I slipped onto C's finger a delicate band of red gold fretted in the South Indian style of his ancestors, while he screwed onto mine a thick chunk of silver. Exhaling approval, Mrs. Austin extracted a red heart-shaped ring box from her installation and balanced it between our two hands, which she delicately arranged for a photograph. We spent more time on this ritual than we had on the actual ceremony, <laughs> and as we posed, I admired the contrasting styles of our rings and what they said about our relationship. It was, in the end, the lack of moment of it all, the unportentiousness, if there's such a word, which finally moved me. Even though Mrs. Austin kept on referring to us as same-sex and heterosexuals as normal, <laughs> we were swept out of room eight on a tide of hilarity and we giggled all the way to breakfast. Even the fact that she could not furnish us with a marriage certificate, the computers had been down for six weeks because someone had stolen the cables, <laughs> did not diffuse the good feelings. We were a white man and a black man, free to be together in the country of our birth treated with dignity and humanity and much good-natured humor by a system which had denied both for so long, well worth the fuss. Anthony, it's hard to follow a reading about a marriage, especially one so well-written and so full of touching humor. But, I remember seeing on your website that you and your partner also quite recently married. Um, I think you said after it became legal here in New York. And so I wonder if, having heard what Marcus said about his marriage, if there's some, something that your marriage as a same-sex marriage signified for you guys. Well, I, should, I think our own response was somewhat like Mark's, which was, uh, I mean, we had been living together in a monogamous relationship for nearly 30 years by the time it was legal to do this thing. And um, so as well, we hadn't had the assistance of marriage <laughs> so far as an institution. And I, it, it's a bit unclear to me why we decided to do it, except that, uh, you know, loyally thoughts about, mm -hmm. about uh, protecting each other in the ways that marriage does allow you to protect each other. And so we, we only had one witness. <laughs> And, uh, and, and he only, it turned out you had to have one witness, otherwise we would have probably just done it on our own, though somebody there in the room would probably have volunteered to be a witness for us. And the reason we had the one witness we had was because it was our friend Skip Gates who, who had known us both since more or less when we met, and he said he would never speak to us again if we got married without him. So uh, we, didn't, we didn't model his our, our best friend, so. So we allowed him to sh show up. And of course, he's on television a lot. So the main th effect of that was that people kept coming up to him and asking to be photographed with him <laughs> <laughs> while, we were, um, while we were in line. He, he, they tried to put him to the front of the line because he was a famous face. And I said, no, you, we should wait in line with everybody else. And he thought that was ridiculous. But anyway, <laughs> um, so I made, I made him wait in line with us. And, um, and he and he's in he's in a lot of a lot of marriage photographs that day. Some some <laughs> some of men and women, and some of women and women, and some of men and men. Um, and I thought the thing that finally moved me was the, the the little official, the little woman who did it for us. At the end of going through the, the, the form of words, said something that I you know I didn't actually burst out into tears, but it, somehow this moved me. She said, she said by the power finally vested in me by the state of New York. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and as if she'd been waiting all her life to marry some gay people. Um, and, and clearly she had. I mean, and she was, she was, I think, as moved by it as any of us. So uh, I sort of want to ask you guys two things about marriage. And one would be to follow up on this point of sort of finally same, you know, marriage equality has arrived. But before we turn there, I just wanted also to introduce the question of race and you know you're both part of multi or biracial families um, and, and we're also both, uh, uh, um, we're both um, a Jew and a, and a Gentile so. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yes, good. I didn't know that. Um, so, and you're, but you're both living in countries where even straight coupling across the color line or the religion line would be a big deal, let alone for um, people of the same sex. And so, I'm just curious how thinking about racial equality inflects or shapes your thinking about this finally same-sex marriage equality has arrived. And if I can, just as you're thinking about that, I, I was thinking about this question in, also in reference to one moment in your bookmark um, where, I, where I saw a moment where thinking about race and thinking about sexuality sort of intersected. Um, and it's a moment where Mark went f from his youth in South Africa to Yale as an undergraduate. And Where I did not take a class. <laughs> <laughs> by any I regret it deeply. <laughs> That's actually what I wanted to talk about. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> Anthony and I have scared. some things to say about that. Um, but you talk about it in a, in a way, um, they're away from home, discovering a kind of fresh perspective on the anti-apartheid struggle. And you describe a moment in the library, um, one wintry evening, you say, Weeping in my carol in the cross campus library over Stephen Biko's I Write What I Like, which, of which was, of course, banned in South Africa. The tears were those of recognition, not just at the way the founder of the South African black consciousness movement gave expression to something I had detected as a youngster but did not have words for in his description of how apartheid collapsed black people from within, but at how his words resonated with the way I felt in a world that devolved me because of my sexuality. It would be overstating things to say that Steve Biko gave me my final push into self-acceptance, but he played his part. So I'm wondering about that connection, about racial equality, racial or inequality, and this arrival of the finally of same-sex equality of some kind. You want to go first? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I played, Johannesburg is a city that, that, that has um, an underground because it's a mining city. And it's, it's a city that has a literal underground. Um, it only exists because of that underground. Uh, that's, it's, an, it's a construct above the earth because of, you know, the goodies that lie beneath the earth. And, um, and that under, I, in my book, I think about how, um, I think about underground literally and figuratively. And I think about that literal underground of Johannesburg. I think about uh, the figurative underground of Johannesburg. There's always been a city of vice. There were more brothels than any other business in early Johannesburg because it was a place of single men who went to mine. It was, in fact, it was known as French Fontaine. Fontaine means a, a fountain in French because of the brothels. Um, and. Uh, but, but in underground, too, because of the way that um, the black people who came to the city largely to work in those mines um, had an underground identity, too. Uh, and, an identity that was, was either underground, and the book is, is very much about spatial metaphors, either underground or sort of dispatched to the margins of the city. And, and a sort of growing consciousness of my own underground identity uh, as as a sexual deviant to begin with, and, and ultimately a gay man. And um, I, I, I'm very clear in the book that I don't want to make any direct comparison to my underground identity and under the underground identities of, of black people who, who um, were devalued by apartheid, who were dehumanized by apartheid. I, I, had, a very, I had parents who could send me to Yale. Um, so there's, there's, there's not saying I have my oppression too, but, but there's, a, there's a kind of a way that I, in, in, in trying to, um, thinking about those boundaries which have been so set around a white suburban boy and, 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 and attempting to, to transgress them, was thinking about race and about sexuality, sexuality together. Um, in, terms of, in terms of our own experiences as a couple, we, we've been together since 1990. Uh, which is the, the year that Nelson Mandela was was freed, and apartheid ended. And you know, C can talk for himself about his experiences as as a person of color. But but my impression was that um, in those sort of heady days, the burden was was perhaps the opposite of racism, 
and was the kind of the pressure of needing to be the, pro, the poster children for the Rainbow Nation, you know. How great, gay and mixed couple all together, um, <laughs> you know. Um, and it, it's funny, I write in the book about how, that, how those distinguishing characteristics between us sort of, be, for me at least, became a, yet, just yet another set of binaries that, um, that define our relationship, like the way that I'm spontaneous and he's careful, uh, the way that I spend money and he saves it, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. I was thinking that um, one of Wittgenstein's favorite uh, quotations was a remark of Bishop Butler's, which is, everything is what it is and not another thing. <laughs> so, you know, every identity is different, every form of oppression is different, uh, race is not like sexuality, it's not like gender, but it also is like sexuality, it is like gender. and so. Um, Everything is like everything in some respects, and it's also every distinct thing is different from everything else. In my own case, um, I have to say that we just I happen to have, we, Henry and I are in families that sort of accepted us more or less immediately. Uh, his, uh, his parents are older. He was born when his mother was in her 40s, and despite this, um, as soon as his father sort of discovered what was going on, he joined P flag, you know, and, and went to meetings. And, he, and nobody could understand why he was there because he was the only older straight man. Um, well, he was there to sort of learn about his son's issues. So, so for so, and since basically, as far as I'm concerned, um, you know, we've been lucky to live in a world where mostly um, nobody was in a position to do very much to us because they, if they disapproved. I would say the, the really important thing was, was the acceptance and the love of our families. And I, I was, so on the other hand, I've thought about interracial marriage a lot because my parents, my mother was British, my father was Ghanaian, their marriage in 1953 was, it was said, the first interracial society wedding in London. And, uh, and it is said that the man who wrote the script for Guess Who's Coming to Dinner had the idea after reading about my parents' wedding. So, um, I mean, he said it. Uh, so, and I was at this, I was at a wedding the other day in, in Namibia. My eldest nephew was getting married to a Namibian girl. And his brother said to a friend, actually to Skip Gates, uh, in an email, um, you know, until you raised the question, it hadn't occurred to me whether my brother's wedding was an interracial wedding. Mm -hmm. is, is a marriage between someone who's half Norwegian, a quarter Ghanaian, and a quarter British, and a Namibian girl who happens to have been born in Moscow, uh, <laughs> is that an interracial, you know? I mean, he's blonde, so it looks like an interracial marriage. Mm -hmm. But um, since I've spent, you know, made a lot of my spent a lot of my time arguing that this is not a very useful way of thinking about things and that classifying people, that these are, this is a stupid question, as it were, the question whether my nephew is black or white is a dumb question. Um, I thought it was nice that his brother just, it wasn't that he was refusing the question, he just hadn't thought about it. He just didn't know, he just didn't know as well what to do with the question. So I don't feel, I mean, I, 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 in my own mind, I've had very little problem with racism in my life. Uh, I come, you know, my, I grew up in Ghana. A lot of people are black in Ghana. <laughs> um, not many people are white. Uh, not many people are brown, actually. But uh, but that wasn't the problem. Uh, I was protected in England by having, you know, going to private schools and, and Cambridge and having, on the whole, uh, people around who were moderately <coughs> civilized, and, and, I, and also being raised to think that there wasn't a problem, so not noticing people, other people who thought it was a problem, except as, a, as thinking they had a problem, not that, not that I did. And so, um, so I've never, re I've really thought, whereas I have, you know, occasionally had problems by, by, because I'm gay with, with people, I've not really often felt that I was having a problem because I was not white. So then let's push at the, at the gay question. Um, in some quarters here in New York, maybe in Johannesburg, 
the arrival of marriage equality is being celebrated. I, there, there was a book that came out last year, I think, called Victory, right? Of sort of here's the arrival of the gay rights movement to its ultimate goal, hurrah. Um, in other quarters, as we talked about the other night, that movement is being criticized for various reasons. Um, one of the reasons that I think will take us into our further talking about Africa um, is um, that that movement, as it has arrived on the global stage, is being criticized as a kind of colonialism. That the arrival of the global gay, I think maybe that was your phrase, Mark, represents the imposition of a set of identities and values on people around the world or peoples who don't necessarily share them or want them. <clears throat> and so I wonder, as a place to begin, what do you make of that critique or that challenge about this global gay rights movement? So, um, you know, <clears throat> the next, the, the, the end of the marriage story in, that I read to you is, is that I was able to go to France with C. And that's only because we're South African. And South Africa recognizes same-sex marriage. <coughs> and C works for the United Nations, and the United Nations um, follows the laws of its member states. And if we were Ugandan or Nigerian or Ghanaian or at the time American, because DOMA was still in place, I, I wouldn't have been able to go as his spouse. And, and for me, that was a, a really kind of, it was, it was a cross-section of global inequity. Um, it just didn't make any sense at all. Um, so, so, so there is, it is true that there's this troubling global equation coming into play, which it seems to be that the more equality rights seem to be gained by queer people, LGBT people, whatever you want to call them in some parts of the world, that the more of a backlash there seems to be in other parts of the world. Um, <coughs> I was at a, as an Open Society Fellow, I, I had to report back to people in the Open Society Foundations today about my research. And, and one of the people who works on the front lines of, of supporting LGBT activist organizations was, was voicing a frustration that his um, grantees have that um, what they really want to talk about is security. That's what they want to talk about, his grantees, people in Uganda, Nigeria. Namibia. They want to talk about their personal security. But all everybody else wants to talk about is marriage. Mm -hmm. And so in Nigeria, you have this um, anti-same-sex marriage act. Nobody in Nigeria has asked for marriage. It's been sort of shut up as a boogeyman by, by Senator David Mark and the, and the, the Nigerian Congress a, a, as a way of kind of staking a claim to traditional values against the West and Western colonialism. But, but the, so, so the frustration of, of, of LGBT activists on the front line is, is, is it's not just that, that homophobic governments want to talk about marriage, but that their own constituencies also sometimes do. And, and that's the sort of age of information that we live in now. So, so um, you can't really control somebody kind of watching TV uh, on satellite TV and seeing a gay marriage in South Africa and thinking, hey, they're doing that in South Africa, I want to do that in Malawi. And that's exactly what happened in Malawi, and the result was social crisis. Um, and two people thrown into jail for 14 years, and you know, a major international incident with Madonna and Ban Ki-moon going there, and you know, Americans with, you know, threatening <coughs> to, to hold back on development aid, and the, the president being forced to pardon these two people because of that, and, and um, lots of drama, and, and certainly two ruined lives, um, because somebody got a kind of message from television, or, 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 or from the internet. Um, it's out there, it's very hard to contain people's expectations in this world. Yeah, they used to say you can't have socialism in one country. Yeah. You can't have marriage in one country really either, or not marriage. I mean, so think about the fact that your marriage certificate took you to France, but if Henry and I showed up at the Nigerian customs with our marriage certificate, we, that would be grounds for exclusion. Yeah. That would be grounds for not being let in. Uh, and um, so I think, but it, it, and you know, it might have been possible in a different era to, as it, as it was to some extent between, say, um, Denmark and, and Britain, 
to pursue slightly separate histories of, of staging the process. Uh, first, extension of um, the right to sexual privacy, and then anti um, Secure, you know, security laws are saying you can't beat people up because they're gay, and then you know, then marriage and so on, in sort of in that sequence. But uh, uh, but now, as, as Mark says, it's anything that starts anywhere is accessible anywhere. Um, and so the question of how to remind people that. Um, um, yeah, homophobic assaults are still not recognized as a category of crime in many states in this country. They're not a separate category of crime. <clears throat> that people are still killed, gay people are still killed in, in, the, in the parts of the world where there's gay marriage. And that, and that the time at which, um, it, far from the states being, uh, being engaged in trying to protect gay people, it itself the state itself was the main, one of the main instruments of oppression. That's, I was, I was, uh, I'm not terribly old, uh, and I was around when that was all going on. Um, so I think, uh, I think that part of what's needed is a bit more <coughs> recognition. We, we have, as it were, the zeal of converts, right? The State Department was banning people from entering the United When I came to the United States, Right? If I had said on the form that I was gay, they wouldn't have excluded me. Hmm. Right? I had a British passport, I was a member of a NATO, a NATO country, but if I had said I was gay, I would have been excluded. Now, the State Department tells other countries that if they exclude people on that basis, we won't give them any aid. But it seems to me, you know, that's kind of, uh, that suggests that we're, we f we're forgetting a little bit how recently our own conversion is, and indeed, there's lots of unconverted people around. So I would say that, that and I, most of the sensible people in the international human rights movement understand this, that we, we, the, the priorities need to be tailored to the circumstances, and we should just shut up about marriage in many places and try and focus on, as you say, just on protecting, on thinking about how to protect people. And I would say, and there's a nice thing in this book that maybe you would want to say something about, about other categories than, I mean, again, we, we, we've sort of turned gay, you know, and Alexander the Great was gay, and uh, you know, we, we've sort of we've globalized and universalized this category, which was only basically invented um, in, the late 19th in the late 19th century, and then fixed in its current form, basically, at Stonewall, right? I mean, so this is a very new thing, and of course there has been same-sex, men have had desires for men and women have had desires for women everywhere and throughout history. But, but this particular way of thinking about what that means, that's, that's new. And frankly, it isn't obvious. It what? isn't obvious that this is the only way to do it. And, and I like your Sangoma yeah. story, which maybe you could tell. Sure. But, but before I do that, I just as, as, you're, as you're talking, I'm thinking about something that the Ugandan president uh, Museveni said after he signed. Uganda has a, a particularly tough um, Anti-homosexuality act that's just come in, um, as w uh, Uganda and Nigeria are the two countries that this year have passed really tough anti-homosexuality <coughs> legislation. And there was this, there was this little. I mean, my, my, my job in my current in my current work as an open society fellow is to kind of listen to this global conversation. And there was this little exchange that happened after Museveni signed. And what is the law? Do you the the law the law in Uganda says that. Um, that you can be sentenced to um, up to 14 years for being gay. And if you're a repeat offender, repeat offender, um, you can face the death penalty. Um, and it, it's very tough. It's only, it's only just come in. It's, it's the, 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 first, the first people have been charged under it uh, already. And it's been go the, the, this law has been sort of on, on the table for a very long time. And what's, what's very interesting about this law and important about this law for, for you as Americans to understand is, is that the seed for this legislation in Uganda was planted by the American religious right, specifically by, by Scott Lively and Lou Engel, who were sort of looking for, for, for greener pastures to save souls once they realized you know, they were losing the culture wars here in the United States. And they, there is a way of needing to understand what's happening as a kind of global culture wars, you know, with with you know red red states and blue states and red armies and blue armies and you know the the the, the blue armies are the religious right and 
but sorry. The blue armies are the Open Society Foundation and now the State Department, and, and the red armies are the religious rights, and you know, what, a, what about the people on the battleground? So that's one way of understanding it. Nigeria is a different story, and Nigeria, it's, it's pretty homegrown. But anyway, this interchange between Museve, that after Museveni signed the law, he, he said these words, and, and I have them in front of me because I gave a presentation <coughs> earlier, but, but listen to them, they're really interesting. He said, and, and they talk exactly to what, what you were saying, there's now an attempt at social imperialism to impose social values. We're sorry to see that you in the West live the way you live, but we keep quiet about it. That's what Museveni said. It's, it's very different to what Robert Mugabe of Zimbabwe said 10 years ago when he decided to squash the nascent, or try to squash the nascent, the nascent gay movement in Zimbabwe. He said homosexuality is un-African. Um, David Mark in Nigeria, who's the person who's responsible for the Nigerian legislation, says homosexuality is un-African. Museveni is more sophisticated. He says, we've always had this, but we keep quiet about it. So it becomes about privacy and publicity. It becomes about practice and identity. <coughs> Museveni is saying, we've always allowed men to fuck men and women to fuck women, as long as they get married and have children and keep the patriarchy going and keep the clan system going. You'll have your space. What's really shaking things up is the, is the way you people in the West talk about it and, and take on this political category called gay or LGBT and ask for your rights around it. And he's right. I mean, he's, he's undeniably right. I mean, we're, we're, he's, he's, he's also a huge hypocrite because the, the two people who've been arrested and are being charged in the kind of showcase first trial of this were arrested in their own homes. So there's not a lot of respect for privacy. <coughs> But this question of privacy versus publicity and, and how publicity is a fun publicity and, and, the, and we know from John D'Amelio and his really wonderful work on, on gay culture, the way um, gay identity comes out of a kind of late capitalist moment where you can practice your personal autonomy because you are kind of free from family and fealty and you move to the city and you're valued because of the work you do rather than the kids you bring into society. I mean, that, that's the story of, of gay identity in the West. And what's really interesting, what's happening in other parts of the world now, including Africa, is, is the way that's beginning to happen in Africa. You know, people move to Lagos from other cities because there's work there, or move to, move to Nairobi from other <coughs> cities because there's work there. And, 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 and um, a lot of the traditional those traditional holds are breaking down in African society and Asian society, you know, hugely in China and India. That's, that's the big story of LGBT um, identity and consciousness in China and India. So, um, yeah, that, there's, a, there, there's a battle at the moment about whether, whether people can be public about it. And, and so I, I read to you from Museveni. Now I'm going to, because also I had it in front of you, read to you from another African president, Macky Sall of, of Senegal, who said in a recent interview, in Africa we have our way of life. Some you may see as bad, some good. We have polygamy, for example, in some areas. A man may have several wives. This is a lifestyle. Can Africans demand Europeans that they allow polygamy too? This is our culture, not yours. They love that one. They love saying, you do we make you have polygamy? Why should you make us have gay homosexuals? They love that one. So that's, that's, that's boilerplate. That's not interesting. What he says next is interesting. He says, um, maybe it'll change. It takes time. Talking about polygamy in the West. <laughs> we think. So the interviewer from the site says, you mean it's a matter of time before the same-sex partnerships in Africa will be allowed? And Makisal responds, possibly. You have the same-sex partnerships in Europe, also only since yesterday, and you ask it today from Africans? Excuse that syntax. It was in French to German and then translated back to English, which is why it sounds like my Yiddish grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, you know, you, you want, you, you've taken a century to do this, and you want us to have it now. And then Makisal says, this is happening too fast. We live in a world that is slowly changing. But he's wrong. It's not slowly changing. And, and his fault and the fault of Museveni and the fault of these, these men who are trying to protect the patriarchy is that they think that it's the Blue Army. Blue Army, yeah. 
the Blue Army, like me, Anthony, the State Department, Open Society Foundations, you, who are doing this work. And it's not. It's people themselves who are driving this. You know, it's people who are people who, who are connected globally and who see that there's another way of doing things and, and are trying that out and are challenging the, 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 the systems in their own countries. Sometimes when here in New York, when this is narrated to us, it sounds like there's something very <coughs> specific and peculiar happening in Africa right now. Now, one of those quotes you read, I thought, didn't that sound like Putin around the Sochi Olympics? Exactly. What he said. And yeah. so I sort of want to put that to you guys yeah. as a question. Is there something specifically African or specific to Uganda and Nigeria and Senegal and Malawi that's happening? Or is this, is this really this kind of global culture sexual war with red armies and blue armies spread out around the planet and Africa is just the place where it's flared up or got our attention for tonight? Well, as Africa was a proxy war in the Cold as was, was a proxy territory war, in the Cold War. Yeah. You know, Look, I think, I think there's no doubt that um, part of what's going on does have to do with Africa in the sense that if, when people appeal to something to talk about as, as it were, the basis for resistance to this, th what they talk about is something they call African culture. And what they have in mind is, is the thought Resistance that I, to the Blue Army. Is yeah, we is retreat it. to our African culture. Yeah. And, and, of course, that presupposes as it were, the, uh, the falsehood of the argument of my first book, right? It presupposes that there is something called African mm. culture. And Seven is right that, you know, when, when Speak arrived, um, Livingston's, uh, I mean, Richard Burton's competitor, Speak, the traveler, the man who either did or didn't discover Lake Victoria, uh, arrived, um, arrived at the court of the Kabaka of Uganda. It was a famous fact about the Kabaka, that, he's, that he had sex with his page boys. Mm. He also shot them mm. for entertainment, so he, you know, it wasn't love that he was expressing. But, um, <laughs> so we know, I mean, it's in, the, it's in the history books, as it were, that, that in Uganda, at least, in, in, in Uganda, where Kampala is, um, that we know historic, on the historical record that it didn't come in with the, this pre the same sex sex didn't come in with the Europeans. Um, it, it, I doubt that it did anywhere, but, uh, but we have sort of good, good evidence in that particular case. But that practice, what, what the Kabaka did, I can't remember his name, it was the one before Mutesa. Mwanga. Yes, Mwanga. Um, what that guy did certainly had no echo in what the, the Obas of, of uh, Benin were doing, or the kings of Asante. I mean, so it was a local. It was a local practice, and whatever went on in terms of um, the social organization of uh, sex between men or between women, if anything, and often I think it was probably nothing, in, it, was, it was a particular thing. You know, there are parts of southern Ghana where there's an institution which uses the word marriage to refer to relationships between men. Now, I, it seems as though they weren't <laughs> supposed to have sex with one another, but if two young men had a m recognized marriage, using the word the same wari as the for, for marry in, in my father's language, um, who knows what they did uh, when they went home? Um, and so that's part of the point about, I think, uh, privacy. Uh, I think actually kind of privacy might be the right way to protect stuff. Now, we have a history of thinking of the closet as a terrible institution, which no doubt it was, and therefore <laughs> suggesting to people that, as it were, creating, the, having the freedom to, to, to live a closeted life might be an advance, may seem regressive, but the fact is, it is better than, than, than having the cops come in and, and uh, feel free to beat you up, um, to have some kind of protection. Um, and, and similarly, there are many people, not just in Africa, but in other parts of the world, who would say, um, I'm, I'm willing to accept the deal in which I get married. And in fact, there's a nice couple of men in your book like this, old, older African men in South Africa, older black men. I'm willing to accept that deal. And, and in return, I get to have a kind of sexual relationship that I value and want. But I also, I also do the family job of having the children and, and the wife. Now, you might ask what the wives thought about all this. Sure. And when, 
and how good a deal it was for them, and my, I don't suppose it was. But, but it's conceivable that some of the wives think that it's at least no worse than some of the heterosexual marriages that some of them friends. I mean, interesting, <laughs> so I have, this, I have this older couple in my book called, called uh, Phil and Edgar, and um, I have a chapter about them, and they're, they're this, they are Soweto fathers and grandfathers and sort of pillars of their community and spent their, their whole adult lives having these double lives because they also had a kind of gay second life, and, and they sort of made it work, and, and I find their, their queer perspective on Johannesburg and apartheid fascinating, and of course I didn't get to speak to the wives. <laughs> that would have been impossible. Yes. But um, one of the wives told... Um, a mutual acquaintance that she knew her husband was gay and she was fine with it because at least he wasn't running with other women and he told me the husband himself told me that um, that 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 gay men make for the best husbands because you know they need to make they need to keep the hearth safe and sound so they get the space to go off and do their thing I mean I, you know that was that was I think that he was justifying his the decisions he'd made then and I don't think sexually his wife had a very nice time. Um, but, but yes, I mean, the, this, this question of accommodation and, and, and the different ways of accommodating in different societies and, and, and the respect that I think we need to have as you know, children of this particular movement in this particular time for the way people in other places and other cultures make their accommodations is, I think, a, a, a very, very valuable and important point. And, um, and, and it means that, I mean, one of the things it means, and I don't know if this is going to work, because, as I say, I think, as, as you said, the, the, the internet changes everything. <coughs> uh, but it seems to me that it's possible that what will end up working will be different solutions in different places, maybe even, even different identity categories. Uh, after all, I mean, we, as I say, we've gotten so used to the idea that, as it were, everybody's really gay or straight, or since the New York Times said an article about it, bisexual. Um, uh, but after, if you think about, as it were, what, what each individual person's sexual life is like, the, the, the gender of the person that they're having a sex life with is... You know, it's only one of the things about them, and it's not as if, when I say I'm a gay man, I mean what I feel about every man is, oh, I'd be happy to have sex with you, right? Or indeed, that I necessarily feel about every woman that I wouldn't be willing to have sex with This has been, this, what's so interesting, I, so, so I'm studying the natives in um, Ann Arbor, Michigan, <laughs> as, as well as in other parts of the world. The natives. <laughs> it's, it's part of this project. Um, and I've just come back from there where I'm, 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 I'm hanging out with an interviewing queer and trans youth. And it, it, I mean, that is a fascinating explosion in, in, in American culture. Um, but one of, the, one of the debates and arguments I was having with these kids when I was talking to them, where I was trying to, I was trying to figure out whether queer is just the new gay, or with, and, and how things, how, whether I might be queer in this day, or. Whether they, whether they would have been gay in our day, um, was this thing of com communal identity, because, the, you know, the, as one of them said to me, um, you know, there are as many genders as there are people on the, pl on the planet. <laughs> There's no one way of being male and no one way of being female. And there are as many sexualities as there are those people, because I'm attracted to an individual, not to a type. And, and there was, there were, there was a, <laughs> such a resistance to the... Um, communal identity politics of my generation. Um, and I said, so then I, would, I sort of did a little bit of gay history and you know, <laughs> spoke about Harvey Milk and how you know, you've got to get together with other people who, I mean, <laughs> I, I just became gay because I needed to be something and I needed to be with other people where, I, it, not because I'm you know, of the same tribe as you and you and you and you, but then it became a sort of tribal identity, but, but it became an identity you know, around which one could lobby for certain rights. Um, and how do you do that in, in, in this kind of, in this queer, using this queer, well, each of us is our own individual flower um, way of looking at the world. So I was, I've been thinking about that, but sort of riffing back to Africa. 
I'm thinking about, it's always uncomfortable when I say Africa, because as you said, it's like saying, thinking back to Europe. Um, <laughs> but, but, but thinking back to the places where um, an identity on the basis of sexuality is difficult, challenging in Africa. Um, there's, a, there's, there's a new position, a growing position among LGBT activists that critiques the American or Western kind of fetishization of visibility. And says that just doesn't work for us because we can't be visible. To the extent that African activists stopped progress at the United Nations because there was a, a decision in the Human Rights Council that there needed to be specific action to protect LGBT people globally. And, the, and this was sort of led by South Africa and Brazil, actually, interestingly. And then the next step, South Africa sort of stepped, stepped away from this for a whole lot of geopolitical reasons. And the Americans kind of, who, who have now made LGBT rights one of their big foreign policy objectives, kind of rode in on their white horse and, and said, you know, okay, what we need is a special rapporteur at the United Nations who will, that, who will document um, violations of human rights of, of people of sexual minorities or, or alternative gender identities. And the Africans said, no, this isn't going to work for us because you're going to create more problems for us than you're going to solve. And I'm seeing this being a real dilemma for the, for Af for the African LGBT movement and for individuals. And we, we've spoken about this previously. Like, what is the barrier that, that these that queer Africans put around themselves in a society where defining themselves in this way is dangerous? Mm -hmm. And how do they move towards getting those rights to equality if they don't construct this communal identity? Well, I think, I mean, it's a, it's a I don't know, it's a dilemma. It's a, because I think in the long run, um, the world would look, in, I'm trying to think of a sort of abstract way of putting this. It, it, in the long run, it seems to me clear that it would be a better world in which um, people were able to express the sexual desires that they find themselves having uh, in, in the context of consensual relationships, uh, whatever they are. You could do that without gay identity. Right. It's, I mean, just conceptually, it's perfectly clear to do it without gay identity. On the other hand, we, we didn't do it without gay identity. The way we actually did it, in the places where it's being done, we did it by way of gay identity. And, and so we know that that... And gay identity politics. And, and, and that means politics. That, and that's, as it were... And it's, it's a very odd kind of... I mean, as everybody who's thought about this knows, it's a very odd kind of thing, because on the one hand, uh, it, you know, um, your relationship with your, your spouse it, it is, among other things, intimate, personal, private. You do not want, I mean, there are a few people who want to conduct it uh, and on, singular. on the web. Yes, uh, yes, it's, and it's not, you, you, I mean, it's not, it's not even interesting to think about as we're modeling your relationship with your particular partner on some other relationship. You, 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 after 30 years, you've figured a lot of things out about each other, and, and every other lot of people who lived together for 30 years and figured a lot about each other, and they're, they're all different, and, and that's, that's fine. But, um, but, the, but the politics was necessary to make it possible, right? I mean, without the politics. And frankly, um, you know, I don't think we yet have a good accounting of how it was that uh, in the United States, say, we got from the point where uh, when I came to this country, I would have been excluded on the grounds that I wanted to have sex with a man, and now the state of New York gives me all kinds of interesting tax protections <laughs> because, <laughs> because that's what I want to do. I mean, how did that happen? It happened relatively swiftly. I don't think, I mean, if you're a young person, it doesn't seem all that swift, I suppose. But, but, you know, a generation is a pretty short time in human history, and a lot of these big changes happen over about a generation. And it seems to me that it's whatever the right story is about the United States, the, the gay rights, the sort of post-Stonewall movement was completely right, that, that 
that um, the, the getting out of the closet was a crucial element. And I think it was a crucial element for a reason that's you know, a sort of general social psychology. Uh, it's, it's, it's an instance of, of, of uh, you know, Allport's um, contact hypothesis. If you are working alongside people in everyday life, doing things that matter to you and relying on each other and you're operating on terms of rough equality, then it's very hard to be bigoted against people of the, of the categories that you recognize uh, in that world. And um, it's hard, you know, once soldiers are out, it's hard for people who have to depend in the foxhole on, your life depends upon this guy. It's kind of hard to be against you, all guys like him, provided you know that that's what he is. So if you don't know what he is, that, that social psychological mechanism can't work. So I think we know sort of, I, th I'm I think I was surprised by how fast it happened, but it seems to me it's, a, it's not surprising in a way, given general stuff in social psychology, that it did happen after people came out because it gave people relationships. Uh, it wasn't about homosexuality, it was about Jim and Mary and Jane. Uh, it was about your auntie. Um, but, you know, it, it would be insane to say to a young Nigerian, um, you just have to tell your parents right now uh, that, that you want to have, that you're a woman who wants to have sex with you. I mean, it's interesting. So the two can can yeah. I just ask, because you raised earlier this question of security, right? That's what the Soros grantees are talking about, or the grantees, grantors, I'm not sure. This need for security for these people in these countries, and that's the that at least could be a first goal, right? To give them security to to live their queer lives somehow safely. You're saying, Anthony, well, the path to security that we followed in this country, at least, was through visibility. But visibility is the path to insecurity or imprisonment this or is death. The dilemma. And so, yeah. what is the path to security in Uganda or Nigeria? So, you imagine? so it's very interesting that the. the Two, two sort of signal countries for kind of progressive thinking around the rights of sexual minorities in Africa are South Africa and Rwanda. Any coincidence to that? <laughs> They're countries where people were killed in a genocide in, in Rwanda um, through, through a long, you know, horrible process of of depletion in South Africa because of who they were. And, and I've always wondered whether, and, and that was absolutely explicit in the um, strategy of the LGBT or gay activists of my generation in, 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 in getting um, protection into the Constitution. It was saying, um, you know, and particularly black gay people saying, I know you all know, as fellow black people, what it's like to be discriminated against because of who you are. And let me tell you another way that I'm discriminated against because of who I am, that's Simon and Cordy. And, and, and the penny dropped. And similarly, uh, the, the statements made by Rwandan diplomats um, in sort of intergovernmental fora like the United Nations are very enlightened um, because of a particular history that Rwandans have. And I've often wondered, um, particularly in countries like Nigeria or Kenya, uh, where there, there has been such violence perpetrated, um, you know, call it ethnic if you want, uh, whether, whether there isn't a way of speaking about rights that encompasses sexual rights. And it's interesting to me that that way has not yet been found outside of South Africa. Look, I think that one of the difficulties, um, which, which is pretty widespread, if not universal, in Africa, because it's pretty widespread everywhere, is that, um, you know, again, we live after Kinsey. We live after societies in which people sort of have a general sense of sexual topography, and you can actually have, in fact, you can't avoid conversations in which, um, in which the question of questions about sexuality come up. Um, this is not, uh, uh, 
it's hard for politics around these things in a country like Ghana and Nigeria because these are not countries in which people talk about <coughs> sex in mixed company at all, and politics is conversation in mixed company. Mm. Uh, politics, uh, politicians address men and women at the same time. Men can talk to each other about sexuality, and women can talk to each other about sexuality, though not on, on a huge scale. But you can't have a kind of general conversation. So, and part of what, so it's a privacy thing. Part of what's going on, I think, in these places uh, is that there's a huge amount of, um, one of the things that the absence of this proper sort of public discourse about the realities of sexuality means uh, is, is that there's a massive amount of hypocrisy as there was in pre-Kinsey. Not, 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 I don't mean about homosexuality in particular, I mean just generally about sexuality. So, uh, Senator Mark uh, is a Christian. This is the, this is the sponsor of the anti gay bill in Nigeria. He's, he's the head of the Nigerian Senate. So. Uh, he's a Christian. Everybody knows he has four wives. He's, he's defending what he's doing in part as a Christian in the name of the defense of Christian marriage in a country where everybody knows that the one thing the missionaries insisted on was that Christian marriage had to be to one person at a time. Does anyone bring this up now? Because you don't talk about because, private lives. Because you don't talk about those things. Yeah. So, um, so there's a sort of uh, another another thing. For example, uh, a couple of years ago, the president of Ghana published a rather good book, uh, a memoir, and, and um, um, my friend uh, Andrew Solomon and his husband had had uh, had a party, book party for him. And the president got he wasn't then the president; he was the vice president at that point, but he's since become the president. <laughs> so he came to this book party given by this gay couple on 10th Street, and. Um, and he was extremely nice, and he was, he was you know, he thanked <coughs> the couple and, and said how wonderful their family was and their children and so on, or their child. Um, but, and that was fine, except that he got back home. And then uh, he appointed someone to be Minister of Human Rights who said, when asked, well, of course, lesbian and gay people have human rights. And then suddenly a narrative occurred was, was, was produced, completely fantastical narrative, in which, in which Andrew had bought the president and th the international gay lobby, of <coughs> which Andrew was the representative here, uh, had, had, had suborned him and got him to, to and so he was a secret agent for, for uh, lesbian and gay rights. Now, which is the Putin story Which is, well. the, yes. Yeah. Now this is, uh, and so, and, and, and I'm afraid that he had then to deny that Andrew was his friend, basically. I mean, he called it, he called it, I don't this is being broadcast on the web, so I'm getting into things that probably one shouldn't discuss in public, but, but let us just say that um, uh, he, 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 it was felt by him and his advisors that it was necessary, basically, uh, not to allow that this thing had occurred. That's the thing, that, that's one of the difficulties, right, is that, is that, so this man is clearly, the President of Ghana, in, at least in his private life, is, is clearly a perfectly uh, uh, homo-tolerant person. But he can't, and he can do that in New York, but he can't do it in New York and not have it come home. Well, we, we've been speak, we, we spoke a little bit about the diaspora because one of the things that really amazes me about a country like Nigeria is, is why the ideas that Nigerians experience in other parts of the world, and Nigerians are everywhere, as Ghanaians are everywhere, yes, yes. Um, don't travel home. And what happens to Nigerians or Indians when they travel back to India? And when, when, you know, and when they get back to India, support the BJP and Hindu communism, what happens to global citizens, to cosmopolitans, on that aeroplane home? Um, and, 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 and when they get off the plane, how they need to stake their claim to Nigerianness or Indianness more precisely because they've been away. Yes. And, and, and what a dilemma um, that presents to the values of cosmopolitanism. Yeah, I think they, that it's hard to go home. Uh, I mean, so, so if, you look, if you look into the, the Ghanaian or the Nigerian diaspora in London or New York or Amsterdam or Frankfurt, these are all places with large communities from West Africa. Um, you'll find lots of people who are 
you know, who are happily living in, in apartment buildings with gay neighbors and sharing the sugar and the salt and the milk with them, in ways they wouldn't <coughs> in back home. And when they go back home, they can't speak for that possibility because what they're seeking when they get back home is to be recognized as coming from Ghana or Nigeria. Yeah. And the first, the, the moment you start talking about these things, then you, then you, look, you, you remind people as to whether you're coming from somewhere else. I want to open it up to, to the audience for questions, but let me just put one last question to the two of you, which is, what is it, what happens for you when you go back home? Which is to say, when you're navigating these communities or these countries where your global gay identity is also risky or viewed skeptically, if not even more negatively than that. What are the masks that you put on or how is it that you're navigating these multiple communities? Well, I think, so first of all, I mean, I have, and I haven't spent, a, I haven't lived in Ghana for a very long time. Uh, yeah, so I mean go back home and <coughs> So what? So go to Africa, when I've go, when I've gone, uh, so you know, obviously I went to my parents' funerals, for example, and Henry came with me, and in the family everybody knows who he is. Which, you know, all the nephews and nieces know who he is, and all the cousins know who he is, and there's no, and so you just, but I don't sort of take him by the hand and walk up to the king of Ashanti and say, "Here's my husband," um, and I don't know what would actually. I think that would probably be all right, but um, but I'm not sure in any way it, it would be sort of a ridiculous distraction. <coughs> so it, it, it means I don't have to live there, so I don't have a stake in, personal stake in settling a way of doing this that's comfortable because I only have to do it a week at a time. But as I say, it just happens that among my Ghanaian kin, Actually, among my Nigerian kid too, I have a Nigerian brother-in-law and three wonderful Nigerian nephews, and, and uh, they're all cool with their Uncle Henry. Um, so, so the answer is I don't do very much. Uh, and if I, but if I'm about to be spending more time in Ghana, and I'm going to have to think about this, um, because this is a, I think this is a moment when there's a lot of people like the current president of Ghana, right, who in public are part of are going along with this thing, some of which has to do with, with Christianity, I think, and, and um, the bizarre way in which um, homophobia has gotten to be central to a certain kind of understanding of evangelical Christianity, which is, having grown up in, in the Christian church, preposterous in my view, uh, uh, in terms of Christian tradition, but, that, but never, that's got established. And so, and, and you know, it's a highly, these are, to say this religious country is a bit distracting, but um, people in Ghana, 95% of them will tell you that religion is very important to them. And that's true of the Christians, it's true of the Muslims, it's true of the people who are neither. So, but it's especially true of the Christians and the Muslims. So anything that signals an affiliation to a faith community is an important part of life for people. And unfortunately, this particular issue, which I think most people don't care about very much. My father, who was a Methodist elder, when he first grasped my sexuality, said not to me, but to one of my sisters, um, he said, I, I can see why you would have sex with a man, because sex is pleasurable. He said, well, I can't see why you wouldn't want to have sex with women. Um, now, that most Methodist elders in the United States probably wouldn't say that. Um, and now I think most Methodist elders in Ghana wouldn't say that. Because, it, this, because of the success of this evangelical movement in, in turn. And just one more thing I think to say about that, which is that this is connected with something else, I think, which, which we haven't talked about, but, and maybe somebody will bring it up. But it's connected, I think, with, the, the, if you want to know what I think the real heart of the matter is here, it has to do actually not with homosexuality at all. It has to do with gender. It has, to, it has to do with what they're really resisting, especially the men, is an egal is egalitarian notions of relations between men and women. And of course, symbolically, 
the relationship between two adult males or two adult females of the same rough age, conceived of as marriage, symbolizes a picture of marriage as a partnership of <laughs> equals, which is not how Senator Mark thinks about his marriages. And I know this because one of his wives is a cousin of mine. Uh, <laughs> and so um, I, I think that uh, that is a big part of what's going on here. It's a, it's a way of, it's not that people mostly care very much about this issue in itself. It's that it's a signal for two things. It's a signal on the, on the religious front and it's a, it's a marker, especially for certain men, of an insistence that we're not going to, we, the Blue Army, isn't going to push them into a different understanding of heterosexual marriage. I think that's incredibly well put, very succinctly put. I've been grasping for ways to speak about mm -hmm. how it's about gender, and I, I think you, you just put your finger on it. I, I'm, I'm not going to answer your question about what happens when I go home, um, because nothing much does, because I live in... What, home is Afropolitan Johannesburg or Cape Town. Um, but I did have to come all the way to Yale to come out. And I think that's about distance from family and the familiar that is one of the reasons why, because young American people travel, why the whole coming out thing sort of started here. But, but I do just, just want to say that what is different about Africa, because you, you asked that question earlier, um, I, th I think that, that Anthony put his finger on the, on the two things. The one is a, a deep commitment to traditional gender relations um, that is socially entrenched and that is threatened um, by a sexuality rights movement in the way that Anthony described. And, the, and the, other, the other is, of course, religion and the explosion of Pentecostalism in Africa. And, and I think it's important to understand that as indigenous yeah. rather than uh, something that's been exported from the United States. Africans do have agency. And um, one, needs to, one needs to understand why that explosion has happened. And, and how that explosion is a consequence of um, the failed African state and the way faith communities have stepped in to do the work. They're incredibly, incredibly important in the social life. Yeah. In the, it, to do the work that the state might have done. And uh, yeah, and then, and then how, um, what, these, what these faith communities do to kind of bond their community. So, um, my, in my limited experience of Nigeria, I don't have any of, of Ghana recently. I, I, you know, the prosperity gospel is so huge. And, and I had this idea when I went to church in Nigeria that the church is a casino. Because somebody is going to say, like, the Lord spy, has, has smiled on me and my business is doing well. And, um, and what gets the Lord to smile on? And, and that, that happened to, to you last week, so maybe... Maybe I need to get the Lord to smile on me this week so that, so that my business will do well. And that's how the church is a casino. And how do I get the Lord to smile on me? I show that I'm devout. Yes. And how do I show I'm devout? Well, there are those homosexuals. Yes. You know, let me drum it out of them. And, um, and understanding the, um, <laughs> that the way Pentecostalism has taken root across sub-Saharan Africa and, and the role that this is playing in a kind of new public homophobia is, is essential work. And there's, there's, not enough, there's not enough been done on it, understanding it, beyond the, the, the obvious look at the way people like Lou Engel and, and Scott Lively have spread yeah. their bad but you, you have to remember that there's a, I mean, so, so I, have a, I have a, well again, sister. <laughs> and if you want to give her, if I want to give her something that she you know, values, I give her tapes of mostly African American um, evangelical preachers uh, talking about many things about, uh, but but uh, not mostly about money in her case. But but uh, and but but that's a choice. I mean, T. D. Jakes didn't come to Ghana and shove it down her throat. Uh, you don't know who T. D. Jakes is, but he's a really important figure in the United States. A very, very important figure in. Movement. So, um, I think it's important to insist that even though there are these outsiders who were agitators, 
the, the, the most of the the energy of this is, is indigenous, and indeed the forms that, that both in the Catholic Church actually and in Protestant churches uh, that it takes are very much driven by you know an internal history. Well, homosexuality in, in Nigeria, you might as well say demon possession. Yes, and indeed, <laughs> and indeed, uh, you know, on many accounts, it is a form of uh, demon possession, and the thing to do with a gay man is to, is to get that demon out, is to get rid of the demons. Yeah. Let's invite the audience to um, ask a question, change the topic completely, weigh in in some way with a thought or, or a reflection. Yeah, I Ira, do you want to come um, first? Thank you for this very enlightening, enlightening and, and stimulating conversation. I have two questions for, for Mark, in particular about South Africa. As uh, marriage equality has been part of the Constitution since the Constitution was created, which is quite a long time now. Can you be a crystal ball for us here in the U.S. and speak to how that marriage equality has connected or not with broader LGBT equality or the sense within that culture? Because you're way ahead of us with that particular thing which has become so central here. Mm -hmm. And then my second yeah. question is, since that is already a fact in South Africa, what are the unifying uh, uh, sort of struggles that are bringing together queer activists and LGBT <coughs> activists in that country when this one, which is so large in Western culture, is not the one that you're fi you can fight for. So what is bringing people together in South Africa? Um, so so ma same-sex marriage only became legal in 2006 in South Africa, um, even though there's been constitutional protection um, since the Constitution was passed a decade previously, in 1996. And uh, in a very skillful way, activists used the courts mm -hmm. to gain one right after another. And till um, some plaintiffs came to the court asking to be married, and the court said, well, you know, you're, you're married anyway. You know, you have each other's pensions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're able to adopt kids together, so of course you're married. Um, and, and, and so because it's 2006, I mean, it, it, there, there was marriage equality in some states here in 2006, so it's not, we're not ahead of the game um, so much. Um, marriage equality is very, um, very much in South Africa a middle class interest for a whole lot of reasons. Um, one is, is that in black communities you need a lot of money to get married. A lot of money. It breaks the bank. And, um, you certainly, and that money often comes from family. So if there's not family acceptance, it's harder to get. Um, but, uh, so marriage equality is, 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 is th there's, there's been no data um, collected that I know of that looks at how many white people have got married as opposed to black people, middle class people as opposed to working class people. But, but the big issue that's, that's been kind of driving uh, so social justice activists in South Africa has been this phenomenon of corrective rape. And, and the, the fact that even though we have this <coughs> extraordinary legal equality, um, gender non-conforming women in the townships, and it must be said gender non-conforming men, but that's way less documented, so trans women, um, are subject to the most horrific violence. And, and there are many ways of understanding that. It's gender violence. One needs to understand it that way. Rape or rape is hate crime. Um, uh, any woman on the street who has to walk in a South African township and who doesn't have a man protecting her is at risk. One has to look at it that way. But it's also, it, 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 it is a reaction against space that an incredibly vibrant um, black lesbian culture has claimed. As a, as a result of constitutional equality, which is really how I, I understand so much of the homophobic backlash across Africa. I understand it as backlash. It's, it's a response to space that has been claimed by young people. Um, so there's, there's a lot of talk about how to, how to reconcile this marriage equality with the reality of life on the ground, um, particularly for black lesbians. Um, I think that because of this this crisis, particularly among black lesbians, um, and, and this is not in any way to um, minimize the risks that they face 
if they have to walk on foot at night in townships. Um, that, that there's not enough um, acknowledgement as to how much South African society has changed because of um, the Equality Clause in the Constitution. And, and for me, a little indicator of that was um, at the time of the, of the Ugandan bill being passed, I happened to be in South Africa, and I was listening to the talk shows. And, and the South Africans talk, boy do they talk. <laughs> Not as much as Nigerians. But they, <laughs> but, and they talk in talk shows, and talk, talk shows are, radio talk shows are kind of like <coughs> sort of fulcrums of democracy, and, and everybody weighs in. And, and it was really interesting to listen to how people, what people were saying. And, 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 and many people who I heard were black voices, and um, of course black, black voices with telephones and with radios, so not poor rural people who don't speak English, were saying, um, you know, I don't like this thing, and I wouldn't want my son to be this thing, and I, th I find this thing repulsive, but, but, but these people have rights, we can't, we can't do this to them. What Museveni's doing is wrong, they have rights. We all have rights, even, and, and there's something, there's, there's a way that that has been entrenched in, 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 in public discourse in South Africa that, that's profound. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's um, so, th but there is a big division in, in, in the LGBT community around these issues in South Africa. And in fact, the, at, at the last Johannesburg Pride March, um, a bunch of activists who are part of the One in Nine campaign, because a woman allegedly gets raped every nine seconds in South Africa, nine minutes, sorry, excuse me, um, disrupted the Pride March by doing a die-in. Mm. And the organizers of the Pride March, who were white women with SUVs, tried to run these black women over. They were so enraged that this was happening. Um, and as a result of which, there's no more Pride March in, South, in Johannesburg. Um, so the, the, there's, the community is very divided. There's, there's a Soweto Pride that, that got set up in response to the Pride March in, in, in Johannesburg. Now what's interesting about the Pride March in Johannesburg is, is that even though it's run by white women who were so enraged that they nearly rode over the black women, it's wrong to see that Pride March as just white. Um, because a lot of black people actually march in that march. Middle class and working class. Um, so it's not as racialized as, as, as one might have expected when looking at um, the reporting of that. Great. Question over here. Yeah. I just have a question. I actually started reading the book and I was fascinated by you looking up at the maps um, of Johannesburg and say, well, I don't know what's located beyond this. So I want you to talk a little bit about maybe the relationship between maps and imagination. I mean, and what I mean by that is that I mean I felt that you said something to the effect that you know apartheid at least gave some sort of mapping that allowed queerness or queer um, liberation or queer rights to sort of be imagined on top of it or against that space. Like I almost feel like you you you've been talking about all these different types of maps such as globalization, diaspora, privacy, and yet queer actors aren't able to necessarily capture that ability to map it out and, or respond to it in some ways. In mm. I mean, so just this relation between maps and imagination? Look, I mean, the, the, the organ, I, I don't have a, an easy direct answer to that. So I forgive me for waffling, <laughs> but, um, but the, the organizing principle of my book is, is, is yeah. that as a little boy, I played this game with maps where I would find names in the phone directory and then dispatch an imaginary courier out to deliver goodies to sum it to the name I found, and I found it inevitably a black name, and then discovered to my horror and amazement that Alexandra, the black township, which I'd heard about, was like on the next page of the map book, but that there was no way of crossing from the one page to the other. There just wasn't a map route. And then later, um, when the Soweto uprising happened in 1976, I, you know, being a nerdy kid who loved maps, I rushed to the map book to try and find out where Soweto was, and so when it wasn't mapped, it just wasn't there at all. Mm -hmm. Didn't exist, even though it's part of Johannesburg. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, I, I understand the world by trying to map it. And I'm, I'm, I'm really struck by the way, you know, Google Maps doesn't have boundaries. And for me, my understanding of, <laughs> of maps is about boundaries. Mm -hmm. And boundaries that I need to cross and transgress. And I think about these queer kids who I was speaking about earlier, who, who grow up in a world that online is boundless. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, <laughs> and Are they I, at a disadvantage, though, from not having that map, or the possibility of that map? I don't know. I mean, it's different. It's just different. Um, the, uh, the, the real disadvantage is not having any map at all. Yeah. You don't have to have, as it were, any particular... This is the point about not imposing our strategies and categories on other people, but trying to help them to figure out ways that will work in their circumstances. You do need maps. I mean, in the end, as I said, it seems to me you've got to have a politics to make it possible to move to a world where people can, can live you know, dignified lives with their sexualities. But, uh, but you don't have to have any particular map. And, and what I think, you know, if you're trying to be helpful from the outside, what you need to be doing is trying to help people figure out things that will work right now where they are to, to protect them. And recognizing that in the long run, you know, each of these is a temporary strategy, as many of the students I teach think of gayness as a temporary strategy. It's, it's something they understand that it worked, it got them somewhere, and now they're some of them are, think of themselves as gay. Google Maps always. I mean, the thing about Google Maps, and you, and you read sort of philosophers of cartography, they talk about this. Is, is that the thing about a digital map is, is that you're always at the center, and it's always the distance from where you are to where you need to go. And you know, there's, there's, there's a kind of narcissism to that. And um, I wonder about how you imagine the other in that sort of world. And, and um, a lot of my childhood was about imagining the other. And then a lot of my adulthood is about, has been about discovering the other. Um, yeah. Another question. Yeah. I had a few reactions, just I'm curious to hear your reactions from one is thinking can you just speak up oh, so people over this way here? Um, a few us. reactions. Uh, I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, looking at the perspective from here, I'm a New York based uh, activist. Um, first of all, the role of class in the dynamics you're talking about. You have alluded to it a couple of times, but very little in this discussion, and there are Visibility, for example, is a very class-laden idea. Privacy is a very class-laden idea. People purchase privacy. Um, people, um, particularly very gender non-conforming people who can't afford privacy, have a very different uh, uh, encounter with politics from people who can buy a place in a, where they can be safe and do whatever they want, um, whether it's sex, drugs, or anything else. Um, so I'm curious about the role of that and, and the role of dislocation, economic dislocation in migration, in upsetting or challenging people's gendered structure, family structures and so forth, um, and how that has impacted life in Africa. It's certainly something that we see here. I see it among people who emigrate to here, as well as what happens back home uh, in their lives. And also just a thought about violence and disruption and visibility here, World War II, was probably the most defining event in creating gay life, at least in New York, San Francisco, and then elsewhere in this country. Um, and that was obviously a rather violent experience and a rather disruptive experience, and a very migratory, uh, resulted in a very migratory experience. Um, similarly, uh, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, tremendous economic dislocation uh, in the 70s uh, uh, created a very different uh, environment, uh, certainly in New York, and AIDS. You know, was one of the ways in which visibility, you know, skyrocketed, and the whole gay rights movement as we know it now really has a lot to do with forced visibility and death, um, and not something that just sort of was a question of just different consciousness sort of coming upon people. Um, so I think, you know, the story here is a lot messier in that respect, uh, and a lot more tied to disruption and violence uh, than maybe we often think. And the other point I was making about that is what I, I, I think that. Um, Marriage to me is often, I see it actually more as a regression in our politics uh, rather than a, sort of somehow having reached some sort of apex. That rather than looking at the, uh, the way we did in the, 70, the early 70s before my time as a gay man, uh, uh, um, the multitude of relationships that we can have and recognizing all of them, um, having a much more uh, ungendered and complex notion of family, sexual or not. Um, is something we've sort of given up, in a way, to privilege this one particular relationship. And we see it often as, a, as Western progress and us being way ahead of everybody else. And actually, I think there's a, a way in which we can look at it as a, as a form of, of hunkering down and, and regression. Um, and I'm wondering if you have sort of thoughts about that role of marriage uh, uh, elsewhere in the world. There's a lot there. <laughs> what do you 
But just let me just on the last thing you said, it does seem to me that it remains the case that uh, that in most African countries today, as maybe in many other places, but that's what a little bit I want to know about it, um, that this, the sense of, of marriage as a, as a linking of families, not as a linking of individuals, remains much stronger than it is here. Yeah. So, as it were, what Henry and I did is sort of almost doesn't count as marriage, mm -hmm. because we didn't Link the family. We didn't, you know, there was no, <coughs> there were no, our, our birth families mm -hmm. were not uh, engaged. So, um, I think that's one of the reasons why <coughs> our, the, the model of marriage rights that has succeeded here is, is entirely the model of marriage as a relationship between individuals who maybe will have raised children, but, and so they'll, it'll be extended out that much. But the fact that, from a sort of genealogical point of view, every marriage is in fact the nesting of two vast trees, mm -hmm. that's sort of disappeared in much of our thinking about these things. And I think that's, so, it, it, um, that's different from the point that in the, in the uh, sort of early gay, well, early, in the gay rights movement after Stonewall, roughly speaking, there was this thought that we could, which was a sort of 60s thought, <laughs> which is that gay people could sort of lead everybody into a recognition that a single pairing for life was just something that had been, as it were, thought up to, to suit uh, capitalism or something. Uh, and and that, it, you, that, that, that um, gay people were, were at the, in the forefront of, of a liberation of not of not of themselves but of everybody. That that certainly is not surely what's happened in terms of the the, the, the institutionalization of gay marriage in this country. It's it's interesting here as you speak about as as you both speak about um, the Stonewall generation. I'm thinking again about the current queer generation and polyamory and uh, 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 how, how the, the current queer generation is, is, try, is, it, is, is, is working within a historic context that it often doesn't necessarily know about or understand. Um, um, I, I think it's very valuable what you said, the way, the way, you, ex the way you expressed how visibility is, is often not intentional and how people are outed. And people are outed by illness and people are outed by um, social phenomena and people are outed by their gender nonconformity that they can perhaps do nothing about and you know it's become it's it's uh, it's true that all homophobic bullying or most homophobic bullying is genderphobic or transphobic bullying um, speak to educators they'll tell you that and um, and and it's interesting to to it's a it's a it's another reason why it's really important to understand gender nonconformity as 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 a def something that that holds these people people together who need to be looking for for equality or protection rather than sexual orientation. It's also an interesting thought because it, your comment sort of suggests that whether it's AIDS or bullying, that there's something strategically useful. When you ask the question, how did we get to this, to arrive at this moment of the, in the last 30 years, your comments sort of suggest there's something almost strategically useful for the movement in those deaths or in that violence because that forced visibility that wouldn't have been claimed otherwise. I don't know if that's exactly what you're intending, but it, it also suggests, I don't know, when we think about, well, what's the, path, what's the next step in Uganda or in Nigeria? Um, well, I, it might be that a kind of liberal political movement is not a, an, alone enough. Well, and uh, or it also might suggest that, um, like many of these moral revolutions, you're only going to get there through horrific violence. I mean, that's the dilemma we've been talking about. Uh, I think in the medium term, even if 
a lot of uh, coming out would lead to a lot of violence at some point, <laughs> as it were, it would pay off. But I don't see how you could possibly urge that as a reason for someone to come out in Nigeria or Uganda <coughs> today. You're, it's basically, you know, you're saying um, we could advance the cause with a few martyrs, mm -hmm. and you, you can't ask people to do that. And, or you shouldn't. Ask well, people can step up. I mean, people, people can, yeah, they can do it, and some of them are. I mean, there's some very brave people in all of these contexts who are thinking about doing this. The worry is that. Um, they're doing it in part because they live in a world in which they've imagined possibilities that are actual somewhere else mm -hmm. because of this new interconnectedness. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And it isn't actually yet. Yeah. I mean, that was, that's the Malawian story, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but things have shifted in Malawi. I mean, it's, um, you know, uh, there was the social crisis and li two lives were ruined. Um, one life was certainly ruined, and now there's a really interesting movement there because of um, what happened afterwards. So the newspaper that, out, that, that published the, the stuff about this wedding now runs a, a column written by the leading gay activist in Malawi, and, um, yeah. and the, um, the, there's a debate there. It, there's a rational debate in Malawi uh, as a consequence of the eggs being broken. Yes, last question, please. Oh, wow. Um, I mean, I, I just wanted to make sure, this has been such a great conversation, that this um, point that Anthony made doesn't get lost about patriarchy and um, uh, the subordinate place of women being what's undergirding a lot of this, because it, it kind of suggests that actually a robust women's movement is part of the way out of this visibility and visibility conundrum. You know that yeah. like this is actually the way that you can mobilize for these rights in a way that doesn't mean yeah. like a suicide mission mm -hmm. by a, you know every gay kid in Malawi or whatever. I just mm -hmm. you know be curious yeah. about you guys weighing in on that. And I also just wanted to return briefly to this question of, that Mark brought up of the proxy war, the kind of Cold War analogy. And um, I mean, given the the totally indigenous rise of Pentecostalism and all that there. To what extent do the two of you see these blue and red armies elevating figures, organizations, warping the local debate by, you know, I mean, you're talking about the State Department being a blue army, but they're also giving millions of dollars to groups in Uganda that promoted the bill. I mean, through PEPFAR and all of these programs. I mean, there's groups that I would imagine would barely exist that, ha that are now flying high on millions of dollars or sit on AIDS councils or this is or that. And I, I mean, I don't, I really don't have a sense from this perch, like <coughs> how significant that warping effect is and how much of the dynamics are really being driven by people that were already in play or would be in play without these would-be puppet masters on, you know, on both sides, Gates Foundation and OSI and faith-based funding and all that on the other side. I mean, I like those are two. What happened in, Ni in Nigeria is really interesting around the women's movement because um, this, this anti-homosexuality bill has been around since um, 2006. And the reason it was, again, to just back to my backlash thing, the reason why it was proposed in 2006 was because it has to do with the AIDS epidemic and a bunch of MSM activists, men who sleep with men activists, saying um, does, at an AIDS conference, does Nigeria have a policy on men who sleep with men? So Nigeria does, some Nigerians felt they needed to get a policy. <laughs> um, and in the beginning, um, there was a, a a coalition of human rights activists that um, successfully kept the bill out of play. And absolutely critical in that coalition was the women's movement. Yeah. And they fell away. 
And it's not entirely clear to me about how and why they fell away. But, but, but part of the story is definitely that the, the gay movements became more um, trendy in the West and funded and fundable. And there was a kind of battle for resources. And a number of the people I spoke to in Nigeria speak, speak about who are, who are, who would, are would be allies speak about how they feel like they're not really welcome and because, because the LGBT organizations think that they're going to take away their funding. So there's a form of kind of activist entrepreneurship that happens in an environment where there are scarce resources and where activists don't necessarily have other incomes. And where um, certainly once you put your head above the parapet, you really are very dependent on George Soros or Bill Gates, because you're sure you're not going to get any other job. Um, uh, so, so there's a way that those two come together. I mean, it's and, and, and in terms of your, your question about the proxy war, um, it's a very complex interplay, and 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 so you know this is not the first time America's played both sides, <laughs> or one side and then another. And you're absolutely right that um, that the that these Chris, these Christian organ, even though. Christianity is indigenous. So that in the, it's wrong to see Christianity as a sort of mission imposition in Africa. Christianity is African. Um, that <clears throat> there's there has been really important support, including from the American government, and specifically in in the George Bush days um, around PEPFAR <coughs> and faith-based programming that sort of established a beachhead in in Africa. And um, yeah. Uh, but but there's a, there, there, I was at I was at a meeting on the exporting of um, homophobia to Africa that somebody else in this room, Jessica, also attended, and Jessica's from Igelhoek, the International Lesbian and Gay Human Rights Commission, and somebody who used to work at Igelhoek. Oh, so Kapia Kalma, who is a, a Zambian cleric and who has um, really done all the work exposing, or a lot of the key work exposing what the American churches have done in Africa. Um, speaks about homophobia as a Western import and looks at pre-colonial uh, African society where there was no concept of like sin around sexuality. So a Western import brought by two waves of homophobia, two, two waves of Christianity, the Victorians and now the Americans. And, and, and somebody who used to work at Eagle Hook with with Jessica stood up and said, you know, I learned my queer politics through Igelhoek, and then I indigenized them, an African man said this. And if you're going to call Pastor Martin Sempa, who is the worst of the Ugandan homophobic pastors trained in, in Texas, if you're going to call him a stooge of the West, you might as well call me a stooge of the West too. And, and, and it was a wonderful thing to say, sort of, uh, in, 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 um, sort of speaks directly to Anthony's cosmopolitan stuff. And, and why the cosmopolitan theory and the Afropolitan identity is so important to me, because, I mean, what this person was saying is, is that there's nothing essentially African except for the baobab tree, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, and the fact is, I mean, so one of the things I think one wants to challenge in this whole discourse, and, and it's easy to do once you think about it, is the very thought that identifying something as having come from somewhere else is an argument against it. Yeah. I mean, Except in the most, you could argue that the Ethiopian church is older than the Irish church, which is true. But that <laughs> modern, but modern, modern Christianity in in Africa is a welcome, by most large numbers of people, a very welcome importation from somewhere else. The fact that it came uh, from you know Protestant Catholic missionaries from the United States and Europe. Does that count as, a, as an argument against it? No, it doesn't. So I think, uh, you know, my grandfather was a convert and, and ended up running a Methodist school. And if you'd said to him, you realize this thing comes from Europe, he'd have said, what on earth are you talking about? Uh, it's, 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 it's the truth. I don't care where it comes from. So, um, so I think we need to sort of challenge that, that thought in the name of, as it were, borrowing from everywhere. We've, after all, you know, we live in a culture which has, um, revolutionized its musical understanding by listening to Africa. Do we think this is a bad thing? No, we think it's wonderful. It's where a lot of modern music comes from. 
So I think we should encourage people to think of this borrowing as inevitable, but it has to be a borrowing. I mean, the trouble with the way these things are going is that, as, we, as I think this book wonderfully illustrates, um, the kind of dialogue across societies that's necessary to figure out what's going on and how we can help them, and by the way, how they can help us, is difficult and, and, and a sort of simple picture of, uh, leads you to intervene in ways that are dangerous and counterproductive. But, and in answer to your, I mean, just on the first thing you said, it does seem to me that if you, if you have a long, we, we, we need to operate at many, many temporalities, uh, but in the medium term temporality, I think the big struggle is for gender equality and, and I think that good things will happen for, uh, for gender non-conforming people as we move for gender equality. And there's some reason for hope in Africa because um, by many standards, uh, Africa is actually, in many African societies, there's great diversity, but it's especially um, sort of, uh, sub-Saharan Africa, um, by many measures, women in many places are more equal than they are in some other parts of the world, and so there's a base to, 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 to build from. So if, I think in the medium term, if we want to help gender non-conforming people, including people whose gender non-conformity consists in not fitting in with other people's ideas about who they should sleep with, um, I, I think we should focus on this other thing as well, in part because it's, after all, a very important thing in its own right. I'm not saying it's just instrumental. It's, of course, a hugely important thing in its own right. And I think, I think here we have allies. And it is striking to me, just in my conversations with people, that, in many places, that on the whole, on this topic, on the topic of what you should do to and with people who want to sleep with the members of their own sex, uh, women are more sensible than men on average, in, at least in, in the places I know. Well, let's um, wrap up our conversation there. This has been an incredibly rich, I'm sure you would agree with me, insight-filled conversation. Um, I feel like I've learned so much listening to the two of you. Um, I know that on the way in, Mark's book was for sale. I suspect it might still be for sale, and I bet if you bought a copy, he'd sign it for you. Um, I bet if you, I don't know, Anthony would sign your shirt. <laughs> Something else you might offer him as well. Both of these fellows, as you know, as you already know, are eminently charming and flirtable. Um, so come up, engage them further, but think, let's give them a round of applause. And thank you.